you're destroying your life. The normal people don't do this. It, it, it was kind of difficult to just get on that plane and go. You know, seeing that they were doing it, that they were successful, you know, and that everything was working out for them was really all we needed mm -hmm. to support us despite, you know, everyone around us thinking we we're absolutely crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Go Hunt Live Show, hosted by Todd Nevins. This is Todd Nevins, and I interview people that had seemingly normal lives and careers going, but they pulled the ripcord to epically reinvent themselves in order to pursue a life full of purpose and passion. My guests today on episode 69 of the Go Hunt Life podcast are Dave and Lena Stock from a little town in northern Wisconsin. Four years ago, they had a 40-acre horse farm and typical 9-to-5 jobs working for the man. Their lightning strike moment happened on their honeymoon in 2010, when they were backpacking across Thailand, Malaysia, and Cambodia, and they met people that were professional travel bloggers and making a living while seeing the world. They returned from their honeymoon to their normal lives, but Lena would not let that dream go. As they talked more about it, they kept coming back to the question, do real people do that? By Christmas of 2013, they had sold all of their horses, the farm, the house, and everything they owned down to two backpacks and embarked on their journey to see if, in fact, real people could do it. Four years later, they are now professional travel bloggers and have been consistently recognized in publications from the Huffington Post to most recently National Geographic as one of the top travel blogging couples to follow. My conversation with the Divergent Travelers starts right after a word from our rockin' sponsor, PrintDirtCheap.com. This episode is sponsored by PrintDirtCheap.com. Jeff Chrisman, the founder of Print Dirt Cheap, and the crew there are rock stars when it comes to delivering top quality printing at a cheap price. If you've met me in the last three years and I handed you a business card, it was printed by Print Dirt Cheap. They're my online digital printing company for everything. They do banners, company letterhead, a ton of direct mail pieces, funky decals, even menus for restaurants, over 30 categories of printing products, and yes, business cards. And they do it fast, and they do it cheap. Jeff has streamlined every little aspect of the business to provide the perfect user experience delivering the best product in the industry. I have personally been to the offices, and I have seen it firsthand. But see for yourself. Go to printdirtcheap.com, use promo code GOHUNTLIFE, and get $10 off of your order. Or if you want to get a sample of their work, click on Sample Pack, and they'll mail you one out for free. Go to printdirtcheap.com, use promo code GOHUNTLIFE for $10 off of your next print job. Lena and Dave Stock, thank you for jumping on the show today. Hi, thanks for having us. Yeah. Where are you at right now? And describe what your view is if you were to walk outside. Uh, well, we are currently in Wisconsin, uh, which is where we were both born and raised. And we just got back from a trip in Central Asia. And if you walked outside right now, you would be in the great Northland. <laughs> lots of lots of pine trees and wild areas. It's, it's a perfect time of year right now yeah. because the leaves are just changing that golden <laughs> orange. So we're actually excited to be around for autumn. Perfect. What city are you in in Wisconsin? Way up in the north. It's a small town called South Range. South Range. All right. How old are you? You guys are married. Do you have kids? I am 34. And I'm 33. And yes, we're married. And no, we don't have kids. And what is your professions and primary ways that you guys make money? So we're both professional travel bloggers. So that's kind of the, the blanket title, if you will. Um, in addition, I'm also a professional photographer. Yep. And I'm a professional videographer. So you do photography and videography for your travel blog, which is Divergent Travelers, but you also do consulting and do it for other companies as well? Yes. That rates from anybody from private companies to tourism boards to you name it, you can find our stuff pretty much anywhere. But you guys didn't always have these professions. But going back four years, you guys had a very, very normal, typical 
life. Take me back in time to 2000 and let's go to 2013. What were you guys doing back then and where were you living? We were living in northern Wisconsin, uh, not too far from where we are right now. We had a 40-acre horse farm, and I worked at a pretty good-sized Midwest bank as an IT assistant e-services specialist, so I was kind of a computer geek. Yep, and I was a sales director for an outdoor manufacturer. And what was a typical week? Like, describe it. It was a typical 40-hour working-for-the-man kind of job. I mean, it was Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. We would get up early because we had a horse farm, so we would be up at 5.30 every morning, feeding horses, turning horses out, showering, doing a 30-minute commute to the office, working all day, having an hour for lunch, 5 o'clock, racing home to do chores, ride horses, and all that fun stuff. So it was just, that was every day, Monday through Friday. On the weekends, um, I would go to a lot of horse shows. Yeah. yeah, we basically lived to work, you know, and with with yeah. that came toys and a house we built and all that fun stuff. But at the end of the day, like I said, you lived to work. You couldn't shut your phone off. You had to be on it. People would be mad if you didn't answer emails immediately. If somebody were to ask you back then, like, were you guys happy? What would the answer have been? Oh, yeah, we were happy. We were busy and we were strung out. Um, But we were (laughs) doing we were that (laughs) we were that way because we we had hobbies, you know, and we were firm believers Mm -hmm. and we wanted to, you know, do things that made us happy, despite the fact that we both worked 40 hours a week. So that just meant we just had no time for anything but working and our hobbies. Yes. But you guys had traveled. It said says in your bio that, that you guys had been traveling for over a decade leading up to your mm-hmm. ripcord back in 2013. How were you balancing that? And if you had normal jobs, then you had normal vacation time, which is not that much. Like, how, how did you guys balance that and actually still try to go out and, and travel? Uh, well, travel was, was a big priority of ours. And it started out as just like your typical take a vacation every year like we had the one or two weeks vacation um, when we first started working and by the time we quit our jobs we actually each had a month of vacation which is not normal for americans um we had kind of worked up to that and negotiated for that yeah um but just wasn't enough (laughs) well we would take advantage of a lot of long weekends and then the long weekends turned into longer trips and then that turned into even longer trips Um, so that was the main way we took advantage of traveling is we'd say, okay, you know, let's stack, take off a Thursday. We get a Friday automatically off for a holiday. Let's take off a Monday. There's kind of a good window to go explore somewhere. So we took advantage of that a lot. Yeah. And it started as like just one trip a year and then pretty soon it was two trips a year. Then it was two trips a year and every long weekend. And I mean, it was not uncommon for us to like in the last couple of years leading up to 2013 to be taking like six or seven trips a year. Wow, that so is just a, kind of like squeezing it in. <laughs> That's a lot. You, you noted yeah. the bio that that in 2010 on your honeymoon, where did you guys go on your honeymoon? <laughs> Thailand, actually. Um, Thailand, Malaysia, and Cambodia. We did a backpacking honeymoon. Yes. And you met full people that were traveling full time that had left their traditional lives behind. Was that, I mean, did that click? Was that the tipping point that you were like, wait a minute, that could be us? That was the seed that was planted, definitely. And after that, Lena just kept poking and prodding <laughs> about it. She wouldn't give it up. It was kind of, in obsession that she was always like, you remember those people we met in Thailand? I'm always like, yes, dear. Like, people yeah, don't yeah. do that. Real people don't do that. It, it's non-existent. So what steps did you guys specifically take? Lena, you, you wouldn't let it go. Good for you. What, uh, what <laughs> steps did you take or, or did you implement into your lives to get you from you know, Dave, you saying real people don't do that to yes. you guys getting on a plane doing that. Like what <laughs> steps did you take to implement into your lives to make that happen? Well, it really didn't become like a serious 
um, thing for us until late 2012, I think was when we kind of were like, okay, let's do this. You know, I kind of was like, I have to do this. Like it was something I felt really strongly about. I was really being pulled to the world. Um, obviously we were traveling a lot and I had the horses. And so like, it was actually a huge sacrifice for, for me to make that decision that I was going to stop pursuing my goals in the horse industry and start shifting Mm -hmm. everything to pursue my, my goals to travel the world. So I actually stopped horse showing. I stopped buying project horses. You know, I started selling all of uh, my sale horses and, and so that was kind of the start of it. And 2012, we kind of just, you know, we started cutting expenses. We started going through the house um, we did several coals in the house, but we started with, okay, what don't we ever look at? What yeah. do we never touch? And we just started pulling all of that stuff out and selling it online. Yep. Yeah. And we also didn't splurge, you know, and what I mean by that is we didn't have that cup of coffee on our way into, into work. We didn't go out to eat. Uh, we didn't buy just splurge items that cost a little bit more. So all that money went into a bank account that we never touched. It didn't exist until the day we left. Did you put a date on the calendar that we are leaving at this moment? Or was there another factor like selling your 40 acre farm? Or was there something else that was going on that was going to push you to leave? We did put a date on the calendar that was like the D date saying, this is it. We booked our tickets. But the scary thing was, is our house didn't sell. It actually sold fairly quick, but it it held us right to the end. And what I mean by that is, is we found out right after Christmas that we had an offer that we accepted. And within three weeks, we were packed up and on our way off to New Zealand. Christmas of what year? Of 2013. How were you? Okay, so you sell your house. So you're freed. Um, you owned nothing at that. You the, one of the best pictures. You've got a killer Instagram <laughs> feed, but one of the best pictures is the two of you standing in front of your house with snow on the ground, with backpacks on, and the Remax for sale sign <laughs> in, in between you. That that says it all. And you know, also, Dave, it, it's there's snow out, and you've got a yes. long sleeve shirt on, and your sleeves are pulled up. So you know, yeah. <laughs> typical <laughs> typical Northerner, you can take it. I would be like oh, bundled up. Yeah, it, it, it was bittersweet because uh, we built the house from the ground up. Uh, we had toys. I had a 76 Corvette, Harley. Uh, Lena had a Mustang. We, we had toys. And just to watch those things slowly go, and then that day, the house is gone. How did you feel walking out of the closing? And we were excited and mm-hmm. we were kind of like, we built that house actually yes. that we sold and um, we had bought the, the raw land and cleared the land and designed the, the layout of the house on a napkin at a Mexican restaurant. So we had a lot of like blood, sweat and tears oh, into that man. place. And so to sell it was really bittersweet. Yeah. Um, we had thought about keeping it, but for us, we really just wanted this opportunity to just cut the ties and not yep. really have anything that would draw us back here until we were ready. The new chapter. And um, yeah, it was just, you know, we're going to do this. And we're going to jump all the way in. So when we closed on the house, it was, it was really bittersweet, like David said, and we were really excited, you know, looking forward, but it was kind of hard to kind of close the door on, on that chapter, those memories, because, you know, we, ha- we lived a good life, you know, we fulfilled our lives the best we could yep. that way. But you know, it was, it was exciting and it yeah. was sad. It was, it was yeah. very, it was, I shouldn't say difficult times, but it was because three weeks before that closing, we told our jobs about our plans, <laughs> our, our family and our friends knew, but everybody fought, fought us. They were like, you're crazy. You know, you're, you're destroying your life. The normal people don't do this. So it, it, it was kind of difficult to just get on that plane and go. When people were telling you that and your close friends and family are telling you that, that, that obviously makes it difficult. Was there someone, a mentor or somebody, other travelers that you were following that you were looking at thinking, no, we aren't crazy. We can do this. We were definitely inspired and encouraged by a lot of people who we call friends now today, but at the time were just other travel bloggers that we had 
um, come to discover online and had connected with, you know, and, and we were kind of, you know, talking it through with them. Some of them were just leaving around the same time as us or had left six months sooner. Some of them were veterans that had already been yep. doing it for five years. And, you know, seeing that they were doing it, that they were successful, you know, and that everything was working out for them was really all we needed mm -hmm. to support us despite, you know, everyone around us thinking we we're absolutely crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, it's, it is an. I grew up in the Midwest, also, and it is not a a, a normal thought. Um, <laughs> at least uh, you know, in, in the Midwest, I don't know, but uh, well, I love the Midwest. But okay, so you <laughs> registered your uh, divergent. You you registered the website Divergent Travelers in April of 2013, and then you sent out your okay on May 11th, 2013, 2:41 p.m. You sent out your first tweet. Do you remember what it was? <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. Come it, it, check out our new site. I don't nope. know. <laughs> Just completed registration for TBEX. Woot. Oh, <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. So you guys were, so TBEX, what is TBEX? And then you guys were obviously planning on not only using your savings, it sounds like, but also building a travel blog for income. I, I, am I right? And, and what's TBEX? Um, TBEX is Travel Bloggers Exchange, and it's actually the world's largest travel blogging conference. And it's a place where travel bloggers um, who are professional go to network with other travel bloggers um, and also meet companies that are interested in working with travel bloggers on sponsorships and paid mm -hmm. campaigns. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from Click Placement a digital agency designing Google AdWords and pay-per-click marketing strategies for startups, small businesses, and even people building a side hustle. Hit up clickplacement.com to start a conversation. If you would like to personally support the Go Hunt Life podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash go hunt life to make a donation. You were going to monetize your travels and um, had you ever done anything on like that online like that before? Oh, we had no idea what we were doing with DivergentTravelers.com when we bought it. We, no. we just, we just knew we were going to travel, yeah. but the blog was really kind of an afterthought. You know, that was like, oh, well, look at people are blogging. Like we should try that too. <laughs> yeah. So, so we decided as the business people in us, we were like, let's start running this as a business. Hence our name, Divergent Travelers. We didn't want Lena and Dave does the world or anything like that because sure. we wanted something at the end of the day that was an actual business. Not that using your names and things like that isn't an actual business, but we wanted a product that we could go to companies and maybe sell or become a partner with. You know, I, I, I could see us, you know, being the divergent travelers of Lonely Planet or so on. Smart you know what I mean? Move. Yeah, absolutely. Smart move. So you, you get on the plane and why New Zealand? Uh, well, I think it was because it was about as far as you could get away from Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Not that we don't love Wisconsin, but um, it was very exotic to us. Um, it was very appealing because we were kind of being pulled to the outdoor kind of thing like we're used to in northern Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And hmm. and it was their summer. So it was like prime time to travel there. And so we were trying to time our travel route to fall during the most ideal time to visit places. Yes. And you had savings and you were trying to build your Divergent Travelers brand. Um, how, <laughs> how long of a period of time did you have before either the savings ran out or it ran down to a point where you were like, all right, I'm nervous. We need to, we need to make some cash. <laughs> um, well, we had enough money. See, we, everything that we sold, we saved yep. and everything that we stopped doing, like buying coffee and going to concerts and all of those fun things. We literally gave all that up like 18 months before we left to travel. All of that money that we would have spent doing that, we put into the same account as the stuff that we were selling. And yeah. then we had an insane amount of equity from, our property when we sold yes. it as well. So we had quite a big slush fund to, to travel from. Um, so we, we were traveling on a budget and, you know, based on our budget, we were well and good to travel for two plus years on our savings without right. really feeling like we were in a crunch. Yes. And when you get, you get to New Zealand 
And was your plan to stay there for a week and then go? Like, did how, what was your plan, or did you have one in regards to we're going to go to New Zealand first for a month, and then we're going to go to Australia for another month? Like, what? How did it look at least when you were when you landed in New Zealand? Uh, well, we planned out because um, I'm an obsessive compulsive planner. At least I was before we left, be. and I yeah. used to like have Excel spreadsheets and everything for our trips. And so it was natural for me to plan out the first part mm-hmm. of our trip. Um, so we actually planned five weeks in New Zealand, and we did five weeks in New Zealand, and then our, we planned to go to Australia. And the plan for Australia was four weeks, and we actually ended up spending eight weeks there. So I kind of found out pretty quick that I wasn't going to be able to like do extensive planning like I had before. And it actually turned out to be a blessing. It yes. kind of taught me how to relax and be more in the moment. And if I meet people and they say, Hey, this was really cool. We would like book bus tickets on a whim and go new places. And it left a lot of room for spontaneity. Dave, go ahead. (laughs) No, no, she's exactly right. She used to be majorly obsessed with planning (laughs) everything down to the minute. It's her friends and sister used to hate traveling with her because she was that (laughs) organized we have to be here so we kind of now she's cracked out of her shell and we just go anywhere on a whim yeah we just go with the flow yeah that sounds way more fun how long into okay so four week, five weeks in new zealand eight weeks in australia you get into it how how far into it did you did it not feel like you were on vacation and it kind of felt like yeah this is our life this is our normal life um well that was kind of going on in new zealand we just kept looking at each other and we're like how sweet is yeah. this like we've never <laughs> been anywhere for <laughs> you know five weeks and yep. so it, there was a lot of like celebratory like really surreal kind of things going on for a while um, about three months, we actually hit a pretty rough patch of travel burnout. Yep, in Malaysia. In three, um, ha, wait, when? How far in? Three months. Three months. Yeah, well, four months. Four, four okay, months. so yeah. after after Australia, so, you go to Malaysia and travel burnout. After the, that's pretty soon. Yeah, yeah, and apparently it's quite common. Um, yes. When we started talking to a lot of our, our friends and colleagues that are travel bloggers and full-time travelers, they had all warned us about it. Yeah. And we were kind of like, no, nah, it's not possible. Like, I'm giving up my desk job to see the world. I'm never going to get burnt out. Well, let me tell you, you get burnt out. Yes. It, it's it's an adjustment. Um, the new cultures, the new languages, just everything is always moving and changing, and you're constantly changing accommodations and you're living out of a backpack and you can't cook, you don't have a couch, you know, the TV stations aren't in English yes. and, and you just, you kind of get to a point where you're like, all right, I just need to chill out and stop moving. So the best thing we did is we found a little guest house on a beach and took two weeks just to do nothing there. Recuperate, live i know you're, you're kind of thinking, well, wait a second you're a travel <laughs> blogger that's what you do all the time no it's not and that was a shock to us that was a shock to us that wait a second we have to be on 24 7 we have to be recording everything we have to be fit- fit- taking pictures yeah. coming up with story leads and then at the end of the day after dinner it's like you're in the hotel and you're working for three or four hours processing photos, posting on social media, you know, mapping out stories. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like I quit my job. Like, yes, you just (laughs) created another job. It just happens to be in a hotel in Malaysia, but it's still a job. Yeah. With with poor internet and cockroaches. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Even worse. Oh my gosh. So how far in, like when was the first time that you actually had income from, from your new life? Uh, well, we if you if you count just making dollars um, any kind of cash money, we had already made some cash money on our site before we even left. With affiliate links, or or how were you making it? So sponsored content and affiliate links. Okay. Um, so that that was before we left, um, mm-hmm. and then after we left, we started forming a lot of partnerships with yeah. um, travel companies. 
But we didn't really start making any kind of like real money until about the third year. Yeah, that's, you know, a lot of people go into travel blogging or blogging in general pretty blind thinking, oh, I'm going to be a millionaire in a year or quick. And it takes a lot of time to grow a steady income. And what I mean a steady income is like partnerships and things like that, that, that you get every month. Okay. Affiliates, affiliate, we make money on, but those aren't steady and you can't really count on them because they could go away tomorrow. Sure. Okay. What are the, when you are talking to a partner um, now, what are the main factors do that they look at? Is it your social media reach specifically? Is it Instagram or Twitter? Or is it traffic to your website? Like what are the, what are the metrics that they evaluate? Well, one big thing is niche. Do we fit with that partner? Uh, we're at adventure niche. So that's, that's one big thing. We don't cover food. We don't cover clothing. Like look at Lena. She's in a dress. So niche is one of the most important things to us as partnerships. The the other thing is they look at us as a, as a big package. Yes. Um, as a couple, we have a lot to offer. Uh, we're both very skilled, and because of the way we divvy things up, they can hire us to do what maybe they have to hire four other bloggers to do. Yes. Um, because I'm a professional photographer. David's a videographer. We have yeah. very strong, big social channels, and we have a blog that gets really great relevant traffic. Um, so there's like a lot of pieces to our puzzle that makes us very appealing to companies to work with and destinations. And so a lot of people will come to us and be like, wow, like we really get a bang, a lot of bang for our buck when we work with you guys and they get like a very complete campaign. It's not just like they're coming to us and they get a vlog yes, and weak social channels. Like they yes. get the whole package when they work with us. Give me an example of one that's recent that, that you're the most proud of. Like where's the company? Who is it? What, what did you do for them? Um, one of the things that we're working on is with the insurance company, mm -hmm. um, Elian's Insurance, and we're actually putting together together a video series with them. Yes. Uh, where we're showcasing adventure travel and various destinations. And, and that's been a really great re relationship. Yep. Um, we also do photography work for them. So we're taking over their Instagram account and they're using our photography to promote um, travel insurance and in various destinations. So that's been an exciting partnership mm -hmm. for us. And you use their insurance or travel insurance. Yeah, we do. <laughs> we do. You've been at it four years. Recap how many countries you've been to so far. Well, we just returned from our 78th country. Um, we've been to six of the seven continents. We're actively seeking our seventh, Antarctica. Yeah. It, but you're talking to me from, from Wisconsin. So how many, <laughs> like how often are you traveling around the world versus in the United States? We're averaging about nine to 10 months of travel. And the other, the other months we hide out in northern Wisconsin and work on business. Where do you stay when you're back home? Or, no, wait. I don't want to say home. You, home is where you're at, where, yeah. regardless of where that <laughs> is. But where, where do you stay when you're back in Wisconsin? We luck out, and my family has a large farmhouse, so we stay with my parents. Okay, perfect. Where do you yes. stay when you're traveling? Because you've got... You know, hotels, hostels, house sitting, Airbnbs, like friends or people that you're meeting along the way. Like where, where's your typical, where are the typical places that you're staying? Uh, usually hotels. Um, well, we've been known to do Airbnbs. Yeah. Um, typically we'll do those if we're going to stay somewhere for a long time. We really like to find nice apartments on Airbnb that have couches and kitchens and TVs. Yeah, that's to re <laughs> reset our mind. Yeah. What's the typical amount of time that you stay in one spot? Uh, it really depends on, on where we're going and what our schedule looks like. Um, when we were on the initial two years of, of backpacking around, uh, we it was it was really open. It would just depend on if we felt like we were connecting with a place, we would stay longer. If we needed a break, we'd stay longer. If we didn't like somewhere, we'd just move on. Yeah, no more than two weeks, I'd say, we didn't stay in a place. That's in not one very hotel. Long. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. not very long. No, not we, at we, all. We try not to squat in a place. Um, 
a, a lot of travel travelers kind of sit in a place and don't really go experience things. They just kind of hide out. Um, so we're always trying to go to the next place, experiencing it, and then keep moving. With with that kind of a schedule, you're either on a on a bus, a, a train, or a yep. plane, and then you're you're bouncing around. And you guys are at hotels yep. versus versus house sitting, which is which is free. What is a typical month of of expenses when you are traveling? So when we first set off, my goal was to keep our average at three thousand dollars a month, and that was for for both of us. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, when we were in New Zealand, Australia, obviously we yeah. weren't able to travel for that because things are, are more expensive and yep. their dollars are a lot stronger on the U.S. dollar. So we spent more than $3,000 a month in, in countries like that. But then when you get to Southeast Asia or India or China, we were spending like half of that, like $1,500 a month. And we weren't traveling like backpackers either we were staying in private rooms we were eating three meals a day if we wanted to go have an adventure we did it we paid for it so it really would depend i mean i would say our average ended up being in those first two years probably around 2600 2600 all right is there is there a country out of 78 is there a country or a place that you've been to where you were like that one's marked off the list, and I never want to go back. <laughs> China. China, really? <laughs> wow. I, I didn't. I didn't enjoy China. I mean, nothing against China. I've actually had a lot of opportunities to go back to China. We will go back to China. Yeah, but China was China. Um, it, <laughs> it's hard to explain. Yes. Um, we we can take a joke. You know, we're pretty. Easy hard going, knock travelers yeah. and we've been around and mm-hmm. it, it's not hard for us to figure our, our way around places and figure out, you know, how mm-hmm. to go with the flow. But China is just, I don't know if it's a place that you can ever really figure out how to, how to be. Is it the language, <laughs> the signs, the people, the it's just, confusion? It's, it's kind of a little bit of everything. Like we spent seven weeks traveling independently through China yes. and it was during their summer months uh, when all of their people have summer break. And and so everything was just really, really busy and crowded. And there was lots of pushing and shoving and spitting and budging and just really crazy stuff going on. And that was kind of hard to to deal with because it was just every day, every hour for seven weeks. It was just really uh, just hardcore. Yeah. And it takes 24 hours to get anywhere. It's, it's a, it's a difficult country. Yeah, you really got to have your your ducks in a row if you want to go to China yeah. and enjoy yourself. <laughs> and then then after China, we came home and we had to literally burn our computers because they've been hacked. You are kidding. It's it's just a country. You no, know, <laughs> no. it, it's it, it's a country that we came away from saying why why <laughs> You guys used to have the normal life where you would leave, you wouldn't be together throughout the day because you're both working. You come home, hi, honey, how was your day? Talk, go to sleep, and repeat. Now you guys are basically 24-7 together. Do you guys ever travel solo without one another? Sometimes we do, yeah. Um, Yeah, and not really often, but sometimes like when we were doing our first two years, we would, we'd have like, we'd be like, okay, I want to do this, but I want to do that. And so we would just say, okay, fine, you go do that. And I'll go do this. And so we'd go off and do our own thing for the day and then meet back up. And I think that's just really healthy. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're on top of each other all the time and you're constantly like compromising for the other one and that, you know, one doesn't get to do what they want to do, then it just kind of like builds up. Yep. Yep. Um, so we try really hard to balance those kinds of things. We're very lucky that, we both enjoy a lot of the same things. Um, so I think that helps a lot, but there's a couple of, there's only so much like horse riding he will tolerate for me. (laughs) And I'm like constantly want to be on a horse. You haven't Uh, let that go no matter where you're at. All right. (laughs) When you meet other travelers or other, other travel bloggers, what is the one thing that you guys have in common that people that don't have your lifestyle would not understand? The understanding of traveling. We can't talk travel 
to our friends, our family, our co our old coworkers. It's just they can't fathom it. Yeah, it's it's that and it's it's a certain perspective that you can only have yeah when you spend long amounts of time mm-hmm. out of your home country. And it's something that's really hard to communicate to people that, you know, that just they live their lives the same every day. Yeah. And I mean, we know we were there, you know, we, we did it. We worked for the man, we worked yep. the eight to five. And now from the outside looking in, it, we have just this whole new perspective and you can't talk to anybody about it. Nobody gets it. Nobody wants to hear about it. To them, it's the endless vacation. Yeah. Well, yeah. You guys also have on your website uh, top 100 travel adventure goals. Is that yep. – did you guys put that list together? Is it compiled from other lists? And, and what is it? So the top 100 travel adventures is a new mission that we came up with at the end of last year and launched at the beginning of this year. Uh, we were looking for – you know, like a trajectory, like something to really like base our travels around, like yeah, a focus, focus, something to really, you know, center our travels around instead of just kind of wandering the globe aimlessly and writing about it. Lena, that sounds like you're planning again. Uh, yeah. I know, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Um, so what we did is we were like, okay, wouldn't it be cool to kind of have like this master list of really great adventures, but we wanted them to be adventures that our readers could also read and like, become a reality for them as well it's not like super crazy adventures like oh go climb mount everest i mean yeah we all would love to do it but it's not attainable for most people yeah so we've compiled this goal of attainable adventures things that you know we want to accomplish but that the everyday person can also accomplish should they want to and we compiled the list from um, national geographic travel and leisure lonely planet condi nas a lot of really big major media companies that had put together their own list of adventures. Mm-hmm. And so we called that out and and came up with our top 100 travel adventures. Yep. How, how many have you completed? I believe we're at 20. 20. Which one of the next 80 is the most daunting? Um, I don't know if it's the same for both of us. Um, for me, it's definitely the North Pole. Um, there's one expedition to the North Pole every year. And it's it's expensive. It's not long, but it's it's expensive. And you actually like anchor the ice cutter vessel at the North Pole. And it's a hard trip. It's not going to be easy. That sounds like it. Dave, what's yours? Ooh, that's a hard one. <laughs> that's a hard one. I'm actually kind of worrying for what we have coming ahead of us next month. And that is Lena. Oh, yeah. He's You've been excited. About Come on. Patagonia. Patagonia. I've been Patagonia. worried about hiking in Patagonia. We're not taking a simple, easy track. Um, it's something I shouldn't even be probably worrying about. But for some weird reason, that one has been a little. Yeah, I'm not worried mind. about it at yeah. all. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so get me to the tangible stuff, the tools, the travel hacking tools, whether it's an app or websites or buying cheap plane tickets or a credit card with great travel miles. Like, what are your go-to tools right now that you're using? All of the above. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so we obviously use credit cards um, that are tied to certain airlines to earn miles that way. Mile hacking, yeah. Um, we do quite a bit of our credit card hacking if you will is kind of the word for it um where we'll open up cards to get points and miles you know and bank up miles that way um in terms of flights we use skyscanner for everything like i mean yeah i do not look at a web at booking anything until i've ran it through skyscanner set up alerts you know and i'm seeing where all the deals are coming from and what the best flights are got it Uh, Yeah, hotels. I mean, Airbnb, I'm a big fan of Booking.com. I really like the layout on there. I like the way that they they put things together on there. Um, Occasionally, I'll book from Priceline or Expedia, but I tend to stick with Booking and Skyscanner. Mm -hmm. All right. Looking back at your picture in front of your house with the snow and the backpacks, if you could go (laughs) back in time at that moment, and walk up to yourselves and give you give yourselves one minute of advice. What would you tell yourselves? 
I would tell myself to only travel for four months at a time and then take about two months off to process campaigns and to be able to get more work done instead of having projects piled on top of each other. Okay. That's what I tell myself. He always says that because from a business perspective, that would make sense. Like our business would yep. have grown a lot faster and got be a lot bigger right now if that had been the model. But yes. but for me, like there was just a lot of romance in having that <laughs> the two years of backpacking. And I don't think I would ever give that up. There was just, you know, I've done that, you know. You can find Lena and Dave at DivergentTravelers.com. Also on Twitter, Divergent Travel, and then Facebook, YouTube, and with 51,400 followers on Instagram, all at DivergentTravelers.com. Lena and Dave, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks thank for you for us. having us. It's been great. Don't forget to hit up the rock stars at printdirtcheap.com. Use promo code GOHUNTLIFE for $10 off of your next print job. For fast, cheap, and high-quality online printing, it's printdirtcheap.com. Hey, Life Hunters. Thank you for listening to this episode of Go Hunt Life. If you like the show and would like to support it, go to iTunes and do this. Subscribe to the show, leave a rating, and review it. It helps. And thank you. If you or someone that you know has quit their normal life to follow their dreams, I would love an introduction and maybe interview them on the show. You can find me at GoHuntLife.com and also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest at GoHuntLife. Until next time, stay weird, dare greatly, and ripcord out.